Barry, are you in the room? Yeah. Great. Okay, so dogs are everywhere, but like here's the top dog, so then we'll ask. Very pleased to be here. It's fantastic to see so many 
old friends. Uh, go way back, way back to childhood. So I'm personally here who I used to be going to extend it to. <laughs> In fact, I can remember how we did uh, drawings of Captain Marvel. I was a bit of a whiz drawer. I was comic perfect. But Paul Watterson, he said, have a look at mine. And I looked at it and it was all, it was all wrong. Um, all the anatomy was wrong, the muscles were wrong. He didn't look like a superhero at all. As I looked at it, I got this first sense that it didn't have to be a hero. That this drawing had something about it. And later on, I realized that we were only something that was soulful. But at the time, it just suddenly meant something to me that he was this uh, anti hero. Mine was a bit of a bullshit hero. All my thoughts were my hero. That's Paul, he's here somewhere. And there's lots of other people who go back to the Wellington days, to uh, the Rattling Tram days. Uh, so, thank you all for coming. But, I want to start basically by, um, by thanking uh, all the people who have contributed to this exhibition by learning the works. Uh, and um, without your support, this exhibition would never be a survey because uh, I could show recent works, but to have the opportunity to, to get together a whole lot of works and write that for years is fantastic. Me to do this, so, it's great. Um, so the exhibition uh, consists of um, borrowed works mainly. 30 works have been borrowed from, uh, from private collectors. Seven have been included from the Wallace Arts Trust. Uh, two have been loaned from the Sergeant Gallery in uh, on the Moon, on the and one major sculpture from the Orchid Art Gallery. Uh, which is in the other room, and that's the woman holding the bird. And that is now together for the first time ever with the woman holding the fish. Even though they were made as companion pieces, today is the first time I've seen them together. So it's quite a moment for me, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, yeah, so let's continue. My contribution to the exhibition last count of 16 works. So this exhibition is a people's affair. And as I said, without your contribution and support, it would not be a proper survey. Heartfelt thanks to you all. And uh, uh, you almost have been born with the art of good gene, which uh, is really appreciated. So much. Uh, <laughs> And the idea of people getting together to celebrate art, I've always liked the toy for Kaya and on the painter, which means basically where there is artistic excellence, there's human dignity. And you people here today are all champions of the visual arts. Your respect and appreciation of the living world flows, flows through the love of the visual arts. You are the people who support artists. Without you, you would not survive. This show represents 40 Mary, years. Mary, it's me, and don't do what I should have done the other time. Please speak up. <laughs> 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 okay, I'll get the mic. This show represents 40 years of my work, but it doesn't go back to the beginning of my artistic life. For a while, back in the late 60s and the early 70s, I was a pioneer out there. And before that, I lived in Wellington and studied art at Paul Hall. In fact, I had my first exhibition in 1963 at Harry Saracen's coffee shop, which was on the mezzanine floor of the Roy Parsons bookshop, the famous Fishka building in that MP. A lot of you people will know it. I remember that show with amusement now. I was not allowed to attach the drawings to the flash panel wall because I wasn't allowed to put any nail uh, marks or screw marks in. So I had to use uh, string and tape and whip it over the back and um, I thought that that 
would stay there, but I was wrong. <laughs> a few days later, I ran to the field, I met a friend who congratulated me on the sale that I made. And I was sitting there, what do you mean? How, how, how come you not have sold something? Like, I, I didn't supply them with lead stickers, and I wasn't that optimistic. <laughs> So he said, well, there's gaps on the wall. <laughs> so I rang up the coffee shop, and uh, those days, of course, it was street phones. And they said that, that they were sorry, but they didn't have time to try and fix the drawings that had fallen off the wall. So I arranged to come in the next day and, and, and do it. But unfortunately, there was a problem to that. I lost my place here. I'm going to hear as well. Um, because that night was Thursday night, and on Thursday night I worked at a bakery called Harmony Buns, <laughs> and we started at midnight, we used to work right through the night till about 8.30 on Friday morning, and Harmony Buns had a fleet of vans that were then delivered the buns all over Wellington. I asked the boss if I could get a lift on the back to the key van, and when the uh, it left, unfortunately, it, was, it, was, uh, it left late. And by the time I arrived at the coffee shop, it was already open and packed with the early morning patrons, drinking their coffees and whatever. I hadn't had time to change my, my clothes, and I arrived covered in a coating of flower dust. <laughs> the patrons were not impressed as I pushed my way through to the walls, showering them with flowers of white flour. One irritated person told me to leave them down because they're not very good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had harsher criticism than that. <laughs> Many years later, I was invited to participate in a street event in Hastings. Sculptors were invited to recycle material from local factories and farms into street sculptures. Uh, we were asked to relate to the public and do some PR for recycling at the time. I chose a whole lot of grapevine prunings, which I planned to tie together to make an organic dog. But I hadn't got very far with vines hanging up in all directions when I was approached by a mother and her young son. He was about eight or nine. The four legs of the structure had been started, but the body was still ill defined with vines hanging everywhere. Is it a cow? The mother asked. No, it's not a cow, I answered. I looked at the boy who did not seem very impressed. What do you think of this? I asked him. He looked me straight in the eye and he answered, it's a mess. <laughs> Harsh words, <laughs> but not as harsh as the art critic from the London Guardian newspaper when he reviewed an exhibition of paintings by an emerging English artist. He wrote, the exhibition of recent paintings by John Hepford, currently on show at the Redfern Gallery, brings to close 20 years of promise. <laughs> I don't think anything that did my show for the fame. It has never been my intention to make work that was shot for a fame. To challenge the viewer to consider something new, yes. To challenge the viewer to share our celebration, yes. The artist is allowed to make beautiful things, yes. The artist is allowed to use their head, their heart and their hands, yes. The artist believes there can be fellowship, yes. The other says, let's get up and dance. <laughs> some, of the, some of you might be a bit puzzled by the very variation, by the many variations of subject matter on display in the survey. Can I offer a few words of explanation? The tendency to shift from theme to theme in my work probably go back, probably goes back to my father and son. My father and son. He was always making things and was a consummate craftsman. His obligatory shed was full of wood and metal working tools, and nothing seemed too difficult for him to make. At one stage, he developed a passion for making clocks. I remember the small mantelpiece clocks, ones with their decorative surfaces, 
and also the grandfather clock that's still in the hall. To this day, I remember this long pendulum swinging back and forth, swinging back and forth in my mind's eye. He made most of our furniture and other household objects. He made carts for kids and kayaks, and even turned his hand to home movies. Marshall Cook, the prominent Auckland architect and childhood neighbour, has from time to time reminded me of the room effects that would appear on our shed roof in Napier. I also have an indelible memory of the immaculately designed vegetable garden that spread out like a geometric tapestry across our backyard there. So I grew up against the background of constant change, new things tumbling out of my father's shed was the norm, and it seems that this pattern has rubbed off on me. My work is full of these shifts of interest, the early portraits, the Polynesian panels, the wood and stone dogs, the birds, the word paintings, etc., etc., they're all here. A few years ago, this shift of attention viewed, was viewed as some kind of liability, but now in an art world where anything goes, I see it as a strength, a record of resistance against conformity and endless repetition. Within these changes of subject matter in my work, my intention is always the same. That is, to make an image of a thing that celebrates its essence and reveals it as being valued and worthy. That has always been my unchangeable goal. There's also a unity to be found in how I make things, no matter what the subject. I usually start with multiple separate bits and assemble or build them together. I join up, I accumulate, I sew bits together, I glue bits together. To a greater or lesser extent, I always work this way, whether it is in the early tile or stonework found on the dogs, the assembling of wooden pieces on the birds, the more recent joined plywood paintings, or the most recent patchwork treatment of the cloth paintings. This is my way of achieving a built formal balance that unifies all my work. My raison d'etre, my core belief, is to feel free to make whatever art I want, as best I can, as the mood takes me. I've always tried to ignore the art writers and their theories. They don't define the road ahead. It is the artists that go first. They are the prime movers. They do what they want. I think I have gone on long enough. So can I finish now as I started with thanks to the terrific people who have, who have done the work. Thank you again. Thanks to the photographers and writers who have contributed to the capital. Thanks to Dennis Watkins for the interview. Thanks to all the others, too numerous to mention, who have offered who have offered support. A special big thanks to Rhea Anderson, not only for her input into this exhibition, but more importantly, for helping me to live my dream of being an artist. Lastly, a heartfelt thanks to, to Sir James Wallace and his team here at our homestead. Sir James exemplifies everything an artist hopes for as patron, and I salute him for his generosity, his vision, and his commitment to the art. I take this moment to thank you for giving me this opportunity to exhibit the selection of my work going back 40 years and to put it before the public so that it can be considered and assessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, I just want everybody to uh, invite everybody to enjoy the possibility and um, just make a couple of notes. We have public programs in and around the exhibitions, but um, they they uh, commence this month. So February 25th, Gary will be talking again. Next week, we'll talk about the event. And Jill Sorensen will come and talk about her scene of other exhibitions as well. But for the moment, thank you for coming and having me here. Thank you.